want to thank the organizers for this opportunity to talk and to be brave because I'm a geneticist and a metabolist and you're asking me to come talk in front of a GI audience about tyrosinemia. So today I'm going to talk about three major things. The first thing is I'm going to talk about the types of tyrosinemia of which you are probably most familiar with type 1 which has the liver dysfunction as well as the renal dysfunction that is seen when you don't treat it. I'm also going to talk a little bit about the presentations of tyrosinemia and a bit about some of the diagnostic and management. So before everybody runs out of the room, this is kind of where my world belongs. I do a number of pathways and most people, including many of my partners, scream and holler and I promise I'm going to show you some pathways but hopefully it won't be overwhelming. It's sort of like if you're traveling through a metro stop. As we all know, if we take the metro in Mexico City, if we know where we're going and we know how to get there, if we have to take alternative routes, there are other routes we can take to get there. So if we think about metabolic disease in general, it's basically just a chemical reaction in which you have the, in which you have the substrates, A and B, becoming C and D. And in truth, it's sort of like a river. You just have everything flowing into C and D. However, if you've got a metabolic disease, this is a block in the river. It's like damming up the river. So instead of A plus B becoming C plus D, you block between A plus B, you're diminished in C, and you end up with a number of toxins, and these accumulate. So you're talking about lack of product and a lot of extra stuff up here that causes problems. Now, when we talk about tyrosinemia, please don't run out of the room. It's really the pathway in which you break down phenylalanine to tyrosine and then tyrosine down to fumarate and acetoacetate. And there's three types of tyrosinemia. Tyrosinemia type one, the one you're most familiar with, type two and type three. In tyrosinemia type 1, you end up with a number of toxins which are very problematic. You create succinyl acetone because you're blocking here and you're accumulating all the way up the pathway, include all the way up to tyrosine. You create succinyl acetone. Succinyl acetone itself inhibits the porphyria pathways and consequently in individuals who are accumulating succinyl acetone and succinyl acetate, you can actually find ALA in their urine. And they can have what's equivalent to a porphyria-like exacerbation. Now, if you're talking about type 2, type 2 is a first step where you're producing tyrosinemia to the phenylhydroxyphenylpyruvic acid. And you're basically accumulating a tyrosinemia. You've also got tyrosinemia type 3, a different enzyme inhibiting. What's important why I'm pointing this out is because when we start talking about therapeutics, we actually block up here as opposed to below here. So using therapeutics, we diminish the problematic concentrates here by blocking above and using actually giving people different disease. So tyrosinemia at Children's National. So I'm at Children's National, and we at Children's National see about 300 or about 500,000 newborns screened in the last five years. We actually uh, are the screening or the follow-up site for three different places. We're the follow-up site for the states of Maryland and Virginia, as well as the District of Columbia. We're more likely to see tyrosinemia the newborn than we are of classical tyrosinemia, which is type 1, or tyrosinemia type 2 and 3. And currently, we really have only three patients with type 1, two of whom were picked up on newborn screen, one of which was picked up from family. However, we see a lot of transient tyrosemia in the no newborn, and I don't have to tell this audience about this. This is basically the liver of a neonate is not mature enough for their metabolic enzymes to function to the same extent, and so they can have elevated tyrosinemias. It's the most common false positivity that we see in our newborn screens. So let's talk, talk a little bit about diagnostics of type 1. In, a neonatal, in the neonatal screen, 
most individuals are identified by elevations in tyrosine, in tyrosine, and then they're followed up with a confirmation test, which looks for tyrosine and succinyl acetone. Depending on the state in the United States that you're located, that follow-up test may be a secondary screen done by the state prior to the patient coming to a metabolist, or may be done by the metabolic center that takes care of those patients. In our particular region, we have elevations in tyrosine, they come to the metabolic specialist, and then we do the follow-up confirmatory testing. We also are looking for, um, we're looking for other dysfunction at the time of presentation, and when I get to the case, you'll see what I'm talking about. Unfortunately, if you do not identify individuals in the neonatal period before they get symptoms, they actually present with liver failure. They get elevations in PT and PTT, which do not respond to vitamin K. They have transaminitis. They have elevations in bilirubin. They have elevations in ALKFOS. They also will have a renal tubular acidosis, such that they lose amino acids from their urine they um, have a renal tubular acidosis and they have dysfunction. They will also lose phosphate out their urine. Many of them will have growth delay such that they um, can significantly be different heights than their siblings. And they develop rickets. And this is very difficult to treat rickets if you do not treat the underlying tyrosinemia. In addition, as I hinted when we saw the pathway, they do have porphyria-like crises, such that these can be life-threatening. Although the vast majority of individuals in un with untreated tyrosinemia actually die of their liver failure, uh, their cirrhosis, and hepatocellular carcinoma. So if we don't treat them, they basically die of their liver failure, cirrhosis, and hepatocellular cellular carcinoma, and they're very uncomfortable because they have multiple neurologic or porphyria-like symptomatology. They have the abdominal pain. They have the neuropathic pain. They have arrhythmias. They have respiratory failure um, and do very poorly. They also develop car uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. The vast majority of these individuals will die by the age of 10. I'm going to step a little bit away from type 1 and talk about type 2, um, in part because this will help us when we come back to talk about therapeutics of type 1. So in type 2, and we'll breeze through 2 and 3 because it'll be less of interest, they get predominant lesions of their cornea, so they have eye disease and photophobia. They also get this thickening of skin on their hands and on the bottom of their feet, and they can have intellectual difficulties, but usually have normal intellect. Type 3, we don't think causes a disease at all. These individuals do not appear to have uh, dysfunction. So let's talk about type 1 and kind of a newborn screening case. So this young man presented at 59 days of life. He actually was in the neonatal intensive care unit because he was premature, um, not because he was had tyrosinemia per se. And you can see that his initial newborn screen tyrosine is fairly high, as was his repeat. And he did have some liver dysfunction as illustrated by the elevation in methionine. He had elevations in his transaminases, his alkaline phosphatase was very high. His alpha fetoprotein is extremely high, even given his gestational age, and his INR was pretty high. When we were able to look at his urine, his succinyl acetone is extremely high. So normal is less than 0.3. Um, and so we started him on nitrizinone, NTBC, and diet. And the reason we're going to start these individuals on diet is because we want to decrease the amount of tyrosine that they take in to help lower that number. And the only way we can do that is to start them on diet. He had, when he had his diagnostic labs, he had extremely high tyrosine and methionine, and he actually was spilling the, the um, phosphohydroxyl phenyl pyruvate and phenyl acetate uh, subunits, as well as succinyl acetone. And, in fact, we even saw succinyl acetate. 
Um, he uh, did not actually get screened for elevations in ALA, um, in part because uh, we, he was so diagnostic on his first set of biochemistry, we didn't look. And he could also be identified by genetic testing. This particular family asked us not to genetic test him to confirm the diagnosis since he was clinically uh, tyrosinemia type 1. So just to highlight some of the things to remember about this case. This young man, despite being picked up on newborn screen, at two months of age, continued to have his elevation in tyrosine. He also had an elevation in methionine, which is a marker of, of uh, liver dysfunction, as well as an extremely high uh, uh, succinyl acetate. He also had a number of markers of additional liver dysfunction. What is the treatment for an individual with tyrosinemia type 1? So the historical treatment has always been liver transplant. And uh, with the advent of NTBC, this has become less and less of a therapeutic. So NTBC and diet has led to a survival rate of 90%. Whereas if you recall, most individuals died by 10 years of age. Um, they have normal intellect. They have normal growth. They do not develop cirrhosis. They do not have a tubular, renal tubular acidosis. They um, ha do not have ric the secondary rickets that we see. You, however, because of the t way the, dis the drug works, can develop tyrosine crystals in the eyes, which is why the diet continues to be a mainstay in the therapy. And individuals with tyrosines greater than uh, 600 micromolar are at risk for these particular crystals. Um, and so the, at this child's last visit, he's approximately two years of age. You can see his tyrosine is still not as good as we would like. He's a toddler. He doesn't like his diet. Um, but his methionine's normalized. His transaminase is normalized. His alkaline phos. His alpha fetal protein is back to normal. His ionora is normal. And his succinyl acetone is still elevated, but significantly better. Um, we couldn't, can't say he's the most compliant patient, but this is a significant difference. So why do the individuals with crystal in their uh, eyes, why do they have trouble with tyrosine? Well, it's because the drug itself actually gives these individuals a secondary disease. So to prevent them from accumulating the toxins that cause all of the problems, we're actually blocking above that process. So we still end up with the elevations in tyrosine and, um, and the phosphohydroxyphenylpuric acid. But we actually eliminate all of these, all of these complications from downstream. So the succinyl acetone, all of these, and you eliminate all the porphyria symptomatology. In addition, you eliminate the risk for cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. What we've noticed is these individuals do not develop cirrhosis and do not have subsequent hepatocellular carcinoma. So for those, I don't think I probably have to review this, but crisis of uh, the porphyria crisis, abdominal pain, neurologic compromise, autonomic dysfunction, and rashes. The, in fact, our, our poorly treated tyrosinemics can actually have all of these things. So let me talk about an adult. This is a 24-year-old gentleman. He was actually picked up when his sister received a transplant due to her hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, and he is supposed to be on NTBC and diet. And you can see why I say he's supposed to be. He's not really good with his diet. He's much better with the drug. Um, and he actually has crystals in his cornea at this time at our last visit. These can be fairly painful and photophobic. The more we drop his tyrosine, the better off he is. And at his last visit, his tyrosine was 663, but he has very few liver findings, although that alpha fetoprotein continues to climb. But we can't actually find succinyl acetoacetate, which tells us that he really is taking the drug. He's just not very compliant with his, he's not very compliant with his drug. He was started on treatment at about six years of age. So for those of you who would like to kind of look up and figure out how do I treat and how do I diagnose, there are actually two recommendations from the guidelines. The recommendations from the Europeans are a little bit older, 
ARFINET Journal of Rare Disease is a free access journal, so you should not have any difficulty getting that. There are brand new recommendations that have come out of the US um, in genetics and medicine. I think it's still the EPUB ahead of print, um, but that has a lot of information about if you are presented with a pr patient uh, with these findings, kind of what are the recommendations and some very specifics about diet and dosing. This point, I'm gonna, um, I think we're saving questions to the end.